Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good evening and welcome to uh, the program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Tim Miller. Uh, I'm a writer at large for The Bulwark. I recently wrote the book, Why We Did It, uh, which was also featured here at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you. I couldn't be more excited, though, to be here today to discuss my very old friend, Maggie Haberman. It's old in that we've been friends for a long time. Okay, <laughs> very young at heart, uh, but we've been friends for a long time. Uh, Maggie Haberman's book called Confidence Man. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to talk uh, with her about that. She's coming in for New York a little ill, a little under the weather, but thank you for sticking with us anyway. Uh, Maggie's book uh, is uh, actually not Maggie's book. Maggie's reporting is the reason we know much of what we know about Donald Trump as president. Um, <laughs> She's been dogged. Uh, she covered him for decades. We won't say how many. Uh, and uh, her coverage has been unparalleled. Uh, we want to talk tonight about Confidence Man, a little bit about the news, a little bit about the psychodrama that is our former president. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's going to be fun. Uh, before we do it, a quick note about the format. Uh, as you all know here, we have a live audience here in San Francisco, um, and we have viewers across the country watching on YouTube. Uh, no matter how you're watching, you can submit questions for either Maggie or me. If you're online, post the questions in the chat feature of YouTube or Zoom, uh, and those will be brought up to me throughout the program. If you're here on site, uh, there'll be microphones in the back. Uh, so with that, Maggie, let's do it. I'm going to start with a tough one. How in the hell did you write an 1,800-page book while also being the premier Donald Trump reporter? Talk to, talk to us about the process of that and, and what you hope to get out of it. Sure. So first of all, thank you again, Tim. I'm You're so welcome. thrilled to be doing this with you. Book's not 1,800 pages for people who are getting scared out there. It will not, it will not break your floor or your tables. Um, but it was a challenge in that, you know, I, I didn't turn to this project in earnest until after the second impeachment trial and thought I was going to have more time. But every time I thought that I was going to be able to start focusing on it, something happened. You know, we uh, I, I didn't anticipate really being able to work on it, um, you know, until after the election. Um, I, you know, for, with good reason. Right. The election needed to be my focus. But then after that, we had the election that never ended with Donald Trump. And we had this transition where he refused to acknowledge he lost and he did everything he could to try to stay in power. And I was reporting daily and, you know, sometimes 18 hours a day. So uh, it was it was uh, a, a more condensed process than I would have liked. And then over the course of the last year, obviously, uh, the news with Donald Trump has not settled down. So um, it was, it was um, bumpy at times. I had a... a uh, great um, help in the form of uh, Sasha Eisenberg, a, a wonderful California resident yeah. um, who was a, a freelance editor on the project and, a, and a, another dear old friend who I actually met, I think around the same time I met you yeah. uh, a little later. But, um, but it, was, it was tough and um, not something I would recommend. Do you have a little office? <laughs> Did you, were you going down to Starbucks? You have a little corner I, office in the house there? Like, what, I, like, what's a day looking like for you? The day was, it was literally looking like dragging my computer from one room to the next until I could kind of feel comfortable and feel like I could focus and feel like I could get stuff done. And sometimes that was my bedroom and sometimes that was the room I'm in with you right now and sometimes <laughs> that was my living room. And it just it just sort of went as it went. So I want to kind of get at the, some of the curiosity people have about the uh, this might, I don't mean this to have a pejorative, but kind of a symbiotic relationship between reporter and, can, and, and politician. That is always the case, and certainly the case with you and the subject. I was asked, uh, Politico Michael Cruz did a great profile on you, uh, and he called me to ask me uh, what I thought. And one of the questions that he had for me was, why do these people talk to Maggie at all? Um, like, what is your opinion on that? And this did not get included in the story, but my answer, my answer was only, I answered why I talked to Maggie, uh, which was Maggie sometimes knew more about my campaigns than I knew about them. <laughs> and so I would talk to them to get information from her. Uh, what is, what's your answer? Like, why, why so, you know, obviously people like to do the psychodrama stuff about Trump, but I don't think it's that. What do you think is the real reason why, why they are participating with you? 
I, I think a couple of reasons. I think one is, you know, he has, and I've talked about this, he does have this fascination with the New York Times and, and he is obsessed with the paper in a way that he just isn't with any other news outlet. Um, I would really urge people, there's an episode of The Daily, the New York Times' podcast that ran in I think the very first day of February, 2019, which is a conversation between Donald Trump and A.G. Salzberger, the publisher that took place in the Oval Office, where Trump is literally saying, I think I'm entitled to a good story from my paper. Like, if you wanna know how Donald Trump actually feels about the New York Times, there's your answer. It's it's a great listen, would really urge you to do it. So that's one thing. The other is I, I think that, um, people around Trump in particular, and Tim, this, you know, there's, there are aspects of this in, in, you know, the campaigns that you and I dealt with each other on, but really this was just hypercharged. Everybody is suspicious of everybody else. Everybody is at war with everybody else because that is the climate Donald Trump creates. And so because of that, people get concerned that someone is, you know, spreading stuff about them or saying things that are untrue about them or maybe things that are true about them. And so I think that that adds to um, people's desire to talk. I think in the in the first year of the White House, I was encountering a lot of people who had never met Donald Trump before because they were they were denizens of Washington and were who popular. worked there. Other reporters who or who there? worked in the who were there? No, 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 who worked in the White House. These were people who who were populating this new West Wing who had never met Donald Trump until, you know, he came to DC or at some point shortly before that. And they were kind of shocked at what they were watching. You know, one one person texted me and I won't identify obviously who or even the context, but one person texted me and said, a lot of these people have a problem with the law or understanding the law. And it was a pretty, um, it was pretty jarring. And so I think there was a lot of processing going on and I think the talking to reporters became a part of that process. Um, I want to now turn the scope the other way um, <laughs> and ask the question of you knew what you were getting into probably more than anybody right um, as you got into that White House having dealt with him since 2011 uh, you knew what you're getting into more than anybody in 2016 uh, you certainly knew uh, after impeachment too when you started this book uh, what you're getting into like why are you doing this to yourself? <laughs> it's it's my job. This is the job. I, this is the life we have chosen, Tim. This is certainly the life I have chosen. You actually have chosen a different life than the one you were in when we yeah. first met. And and it's for all for all the reasons you just said, right? You were right. like, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. This is this is not healthy, um, and not a party that you know. You felt like the Republican Party was not a party that you wanted to be part of as Donald Trump was taking it over. Um, my job is to cover politics. Um, my job is also to cover government. And my job is, um, my obligation I felt was to my newspaper, which uh, had not spent a ton of time imagining what a Donald Trump presidency might look like um, yeah. before election day 2016. And I felt an obligation to, um, to see it through. But, uh, you know, by, the middle of the second term, I mean, didn't you have moments where you're like, I just want to get out of this asshole's head? Like, I really just, uh, like, I want to go right, to write about something what, else. What second term? There was no second, second term. Uh, sec sorry, second year. Second year of the first term. <laughs> I was just I mean, like, I, did I miss something? What are you talking about? <laughs> We're in the, the second term. Haven't you been right, listening right, to exactly. Carrie Lake? Right, this he's is secret, my He's secretly in charge. Lynn Wood told me all about it, actually. This is my inception moment. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, I, um, I... I've had many moments of thinking, um, <laughs> I, you know, I could have stayed a bartender, right? Sure. Um, <laughs> five years ago. Um, but I, I will tell you, I had moments like that on every, every beat I've covered with every candidate. I mean, it's obviously more acute here sure. and it's, um, it, the stakes are different and the intensity is different, but there were plenty of moments before December, 2001, when I was like, I'm eager to be moving on from the Rudy Giuliani mayoralty. Um, you know, there were there were moments in many moments during the Bloomberg campaign of that same year where I thought, well, this campaign will be over and we won't be dealing with these people going forward. And that obviously didn't work out either. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is um, some of this just comes with the territory. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's it, this has been this has been a grind. It's been a grind for every reporter covering it. 
I think it's been a grind for you in particular. I'm just worried about your mental health. That's all. Okay, let's. You should uh, say that more. It's good. It, it'll it'll sink in for the audience if you if you keep. Saying <laughs> that. I'm worried about you. Um, but uh, so especially after having spent time reading through all this, and there's just so much. The thing that I liked about the book so much is that you know it's just it creates these through lines from Donald Trump, the performer as a real estate man to Donald Trump to perform as the president, right? And, 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 you know, that I think is what made it distinct from the slog of, you know, going through all these other sort of Trump era books. And, and I think shed, like made, made you look at things in new lights, not, not stuff that you wouldn't have known already about Donald Trump, but, but things that made you think about it. And there was one scene that was very early that I want to bring up, um, which is Trump standing on the sidewalk outside of Trump Tower, just wanting to be recognized. And um, I, I, and there was just something about that scene I just would wish you'd like to talk about because it, in a lot of ways, speaks to like the pathologies that like led us to to where we are right now, where he just still just wants to be recognized. Yeah, it, it was. I was a little surprised um, when I heard about this, and then I I checked it out with some other people who knew him then, and they said this is indeed something he he would do. He would some mornings leave the Trump Tower residence, which is on 56th Street between Madison and Fifth Avenue uh, in Manhattan. And he would turn right and he would go to Fifth Avenue and he would sort of creep closer to the entrance to Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue. And he would peer into people's faces to see if they recognized him. And this is pre part of the deal. This is this is, you know, mid to early 1980s when he's becoming famous, but not hugely famous. And some people would recognize him and it would just be this kind of electric charge for him to get recognized. Um, there is no pure motive that he had uh, in running for president than being celebrated and being famous. Uh, a point he said to me in, in one of our interviews uh, in, in a moment of pretty surprising candor, but he started telling this story about, you know, and imagine he said, before I did the presidency, as if it was like a show. And then he was saying that he had been famous and rich, but he had all these friends who were rich, but not famous. And, you know, they needed his help to get a table at a restaurant. He makes up one of his apocryphal stories about someone calling him for help. And it's identical to a story he's been telling since 1984. He first told it to Lois Romano at the Washington Post. And then he says, the question I get asked more often than any other is, would I do it again? And I said, what's the answer? And he said, I think the answer is, yeah, yes, because the way I look at it, I have so many rich friends and nobody knows who they are. And I was yeah. really struck uh, that he said it. You know, in fairness, in, in a later interview when I asked him, what he liked about the presidency, he said, getting things done, and he listed a few accomplishments. But I think his earlier answer was, was the real one. And I want to stay in the past a little bit, but just because that's so, so relevant to like the big question right now. I mean, isn't that not that you have any secret knowledge of like what Donald Trump is going to do going forward? But isn't that just still the relevant item when you're like when assessing Trump the person about what drives him and when trying to decide what is he going to do in the coming years, whether running for president or not? Like. Isn't he still the guy that just wants to be recognized on the street corner? Like, doesn't that make you think he'll he'll run again? It does. I mean, I think that I think that there there is there is some id like impulse that basically just continues to want to get back the most attention that he ever had, um, and which he thinks was taken from him. I also think there's another component, which is that he you know actually is acutely aware that he is facing significant legal threats right now from the Justice Department, and he thinks that if he announces for president that he won't get indicted, which I think is uh, not right, but I think that's how he's looking at it. And so I think those two combined factors, because one thing too that I write about in the book, as you know, is how he tries to inoculate himself through investigation, with in, in investigations, not by avoiding taking certain actions, but by, you know, taking, um, not by doing things that would avoid prosecutors looking at him, but once they are, you know, trying to head off trouble. Um, and so I, I think both things are in keeping with the theme. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's go back down that, that uh, path more, though, because that was something that was one of the light bulb moments for me reading, reading through it was just, uh, because it was the part of Trump's background that I didn't really know as well, as intimately, was just mm -hmm. the way that he navigated through the prosecutors in New York, uh, the, you know, it was whether it was Giuliani or before that, it was Morgenthau, am I saying that name correctly? Um, and like how he, how he navigated them, 
trying to, you know, carrots and sticks, like trying to determine what kind of type of leverage he had. Like this does seem a piece of, of, of that, right? And probably how he's looking at the federal investigation so to him now. So talk, talk more about how he dealt with like some specific examples from that time. Yeah, it, you know, it, how he dealt with prosecutors um, was something that I started exploring, you know, well before we knew about this documents investigation, right, which I think is actually the one that pre presents the greatest threat to him. Certainly these January 6th investigations were going on, but he he collects people. He has always collected people. You know, Roy Cohn, his mentor um, and lawyer, was also somebody who collected people. But in, in Trump's case, he developed these relationships after he first gets investigated in, in uh, the 1970s by a Brooklyn federal prosecutor who, by sheer coincidence, also performed my wedding ceremony. Uh, and I did not <laughs> know that until I started um, researching this book um, because he later became a, a chief judge in Brooklyn. But at the time, he conducted a six month investigation real, very quietly um, based off of reporting by Wayne Barrett, who is the muckraking journalist who really paved the way for us all, for all of us who have, have covered Trump and done any investigations on Trump. Um, and it, it didn't go anywhere. It was a weak witness. Um, Trump starts bragging to people, you know, about surviving this and complaining about what he had endured. But he had met with investigators without a lawyer present and had basically just convinced them of his innocence. And this became a template for how he would deal with trouble going forward. And so he soon, you know, a few years later, befriends Robert Morgenthau, the Manhattan DA, whose jurisdiction was Trump's, you know, area in Manhattan. And Tr you know, Morgenthau represented a certain type of elite power. So I think that was part of what, what the appeal was. But part of it was that Trump considered it very useful to have a relationship with the district attorney. And the district attorney was perfectly fine having this kind of relationship with Trump. He visited Trump at Mar-a-Lago. Um, you know, he got invited aboard Trump's yacht. Trump held a fundraiser for him in 2005. Um, all things that were pretty surprising to me to discover. Trump similarly tried to cultivate Rudy Giuliani, who was the Manhattan federal prosecutor. And you see that over time. Fast forward to 2017, when Trump is being investigated in by Robert Mueller, when he's first appointment, the special, appointed the special counsel. And Trump's immediate instinct is, I want to go talk to Mueller. And his lawyers have to tell him, like, no, you're not walking across the street to go talk to Robert Mueller um, and leave the White House. But this is his belief, is that it can all be some kind of background deal. There was a similar kind of attitude that I thought was interesting going back about the, the Trump origin story. And I'll, I'll let you talk, because I don't... I uh, don't know if I'll get it exactly right from memory, but there's a press conference, and it's always uh, dealing with the press, and, and he says that he's there, but maybe he wasn't actually there as a young man, and uh, uh, there's a builder that was, you know, that had done a project, and, yeah. you know, he says that the builder doesn't get enough credit at the press conference, the politicians get all the credit, and then he writes about it and about how it was a rainy day, and, you know, you went back into the research, and it was actually a sunny day, and, it, and the guy did get credit, but, but just talk about that and kind of how, like, what he learned from that sort of tabloid area time about those kind of press, dealing yeah. with the press. So, um, it's interesting. So that story is something that Trump first, that I could find, and maybe he had told it before, but I, he, he tells this New York Times reporter in 1980 about how in 1964, when he was 18, his father took him to the Verrazano Bridge dedication ceremony, um, uh, which was this massive project linking Brooklyn to Staten Island. It had been delayed for decades. And Robert Moses, you know, the featured uh, man in The Power Broker by Robert Caro, who was just this sort of avatar of, of raw power in, in, in real estate and developing power in New York, um, is the MC. And in Trump's telling, the rain was pouring down for hours, this poor bridge designer is standing off in the corner and no one's paying any attention to him. And he came all the way over here to develop this bridge for us. And that's when I realized I'm not going to let, you know, you, you can't become anyone's sucker. And not being a sucker or a loser is a big thing for Trump. And when I was going over this sort of, you know, foundational moment in Trump's own telling with a colleague, the colleague said, check, check the weather that day. And I checked and it was sunny. And, um, I, and, I, and I checked the ceremony and, and Robert Moses like extolled praise on this guy. He just, in what appeared to be a slip, forgot to mention his name, although other people mentioned his name later on. Um, and in Trump's mind, it seemed like 
not having your name said was some massive insult and that nobody could have done something like that by accident. It had to be intentional to hurt him. Um, and the comments went unchecked for many, many years, but with reason, because who would get stuff like that wrong? But it became well, who very- Who would clear. lie about that? Right, how, how it became clear just how little of what he says about himself um, can be relied on, which is very complicated when you're covering a president. So this is a story that, this is why I wanted to get your two cents on, you led right to it, is just now with the benefit of hindsight, and you lived in tabloid culture, you were a tabloid, you know, I don't mean that in pejorative, but you worked for the don't tabloids as a reporter, you don't take it, I know you don't take it as one, but you know, who knows, out there on YouTube, somebody <laughs> might. Um, and uh, so you worked you know, there, now you've done, gone back and done some research, kind of refreshed memory of how it, how it covered Trump, like, this is how the monster was created, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, you know, and, and a lot of it was, was driven by this desire to see his name, you know, desire, you know to get the name mentioned. Um, I, now, rereading everything, like, what are lessons that you took from kind of the mistakes of the, how, of the media Trump relationship during that era? So I'll answer by um, talking about a scene from one of my favorite journalism movies, uh, which is Shattered Glass, in which at the very end, um, the, uh, the the character who is playing, uh, I think Chuck Lane, the editor at the New Republic, is explaining to a colleague, Chloe Sevigny, that they have let this, this um, fabricator, Stephen Glass, just write these stories that were, you know, he says something like we, he fed us fiction after fiction and we let him because we found him entertaining. And I was thinking about that the other day in the context of what I think is a significant criticism of the media that covered him in the 70s, 80s, 90s, when he was myth making about himself and describing himself as this titan of industry commensurate with, um, you know, uh, uh, major tycoons in New York City. And, and he just was not either in real estate or on Wall Street, but he became synonymous with wealth nationally, not just in New York City. He became this just sort of ubiquitous brand. Um, and that was a failure because, uh, you know, people were just reprinting what he was saying, often without checking. And people told me later that, you know, it was pretty known that he lied a lot or said things that weren't true a lot. Um, but the media's uh, tendency is to give the benefit of the doubt and you know assume that some somebody might be telling the truth or could be telling the truth and and he got that you know far longer than than you know f far after it was clear that he was saying things that weren't true um, and part of the reason Tim is because people found him entertaining and that's why I kept thinking about that shattered glass line um, you know for a long time it was sort of he was treated like a, a harmless sideshow. And it really should have been clear in the 1980s in New York City, particularly the late 1980s when he's taking out, you know, full page advertisements in New York newspapers, calling for the death penalty for teenagers who had been arrested in a, in a, a brutal case, an attack on a, on a woman, a jogger in Central Park, whose convictions were later overturned and their, their confessions were deemed coerced. And he's taking out a full page ad saying, bring back the death penalty, bring back our police. Uh, these things add up. What was it about his insight in that time? Like what was the insight that he had in the 80s? It's not like Donald Trump's the only person that wanted attention. You know, like what was it that allowed him to kind of reach that level in, in this sort of relationship with the media and the tabloids and what, you know, what was his unique insight, do you think? Or I think that he recognized, at least with the New York Post in particular, that he was able to turn himself into a commodity. And there just became this symbiotic relationship with the paper in a way that he didn't have with another paper, but that he did have with some television reporters, right? I mean, there's this, this um, these clips of Rona Barrett interviewing him in 1980, where he actually says, you know, maybe I'll run for president. Um, uh, there were, there were, you know, Barbara Walters interviewed him a bunch. Um, several other people did as well. Um, he made for good copy. He made for, you know, watchable television. And he was aware that this was the case. And he was aware that people who were perceived as rich were generally not as accessible as he was. And, and he used that to his advantage. Um, I want to move on to some other topics. So there's a follow-up from an er that is related to an earlier question from the audience that, that I think is a good question to ask. Uh, just thinking about his, 
how he dealt with, you know, you went back and looked at how he dealt with all the prosecutors, all the investigations into him, you know, financial and otherwise from 80s going on forward. Um, now, you know, fast forwarding to now and think about the investigations, do you, do you think, is he the type of person that would ever accept some sort of plea bargain to evade punishment by the government? Do you think that he would ever, that, that, you know, people sometimes talk about these fanciful deals, maybe Biden tells them that, hey, I'll pardon you if you just don't run. Uh, is that, is, do you see anything like that as plausible? I think anything is plausible with him. You know, I mean, one, one, one thing that, no, I really do. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that you can't ever assume that he will not do something if, if he finds a corner of self-interest in it. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, don't, I don't think he wants to be indicted. Now, I know, and I mentioned this in the book, that some of his allies were talking during the transition, when it, this is you know, pre-January 6th, uh, 2021, we're talking about um, whether there was a possibility of negotiating some kind of a global settlement for him. Mm -hmm. And he just, you know, it went nowhere. And so, you know, I think it would take his back being more visibly against the wall than it is now for that to happen. But I do think- it And it's hard to see, I mean, with the Roy Cohn, um, you know, before we move on to president, to more president day stuff, the, the, you know, I mean, it's hard to imagine that the Roy Cohn in Donald Trump is going to, you know, want to do it, cut a deal, you know, especially well, given the leverage that he's got. It's funny that you say that. So, you know, Roy Cohn, you know, always says fight like, uh, said fight like hell and yeah. don't back down. And except, except, you know, the first case that Roy Cohn represents Trump in is this housing discrimination lawsuit against Trump and his father and their company. And they settle yeah, after two right. years. Because, it, because after, you know, several stunts and feints in court uh, and the judge gets irritated, you know, yeah. it became clear this wasn't going anywhere. So. So Trump's whole I never settle is, is always the case, except for when he does. <laughs> uh, that's what I was going for. Um, the, uh, uh, I want to talk about another element of him, uh, of Trump, that I've wanted to ask you about. Hey, to me, like his super, like, uh, on the one hand, his superpower is his shamelessness. Right? He yes, just has the shamelessness that, like, not, that it's hard to imitate, right? But on the other hand, he's very, he has a sensitivity to him to a little bit. I, that one of my favorite uh, little anecdotes, I think, was in the prologue of the book, um, or, or uh, was um, about Trump winning the presidency. That wasn't, wasn't my favorite part because of that. That was a dark memory. But um, was what happened after, where he said, um, uh, you tell Maggie that nobody took my Twitter away. Uh, like he had just become the leader of the free world, and yet he was still wrapped around the axle over the fact that you had written a story about how somebody had taken his Twitter away from him in the final weeks of the campaign. Like this seems to me like a person that does have some vulnerability, right? So like, how do you how do you square that? So I, I write in the prologue that he, um, you know, has both over time has had the thickest skin and thinnest skin of anyone I've ever covered. You know, he really does slough off stories and coverage that would flatten other people. Um, and in some cases he revels in really prurient coverage that would disturb other people. Um, but then if you, if it gets down to something that he considers a personal insecurity, to your point, he gets very upset. So one was the, he, he's very, very, very sensitive to the idea that anyone is controlling him or puppeteering him. And so the idea that his Twitter feed had been taken away from him spoke to that. He didn't like, it was totally true. Um, and we wrote about it in a story the Sunday before the election in a story that leaned way too hard into the idea that he was going to lose. Um, and that was, you know, I would like to have that one back in retrospect, but there was a lot of really good reporting in it. Because uh, in fairness, most of the people working for him thought he was going to lose too. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, uh, they did get him to take Twitter off his phone and they had staff tweeting, which actually really helped him in those final two weeks. But he hated the idea that anybody knew that because it meant that he was being controlled. So at 11 p.m. on election night, when my colleague Pat Healy calls him to get a comment about him having clearly about to win, he says, thank you, thank you, great honor, great honor. You tell Maggie that nobody took my Twitter away. And, um, and it was really quite striking. Um, you know, it might've been a little earlier than 11, but it was, but it was, it was late. Um, and, you know, there were, there was an, another moment that I write about where he, um, I, I saw me on television. 
he saw me on Charlie Rose in 2017, which he only saw because he was apparently flipping channels during a commercial on Lou Dobbs. Yes, I do actually. <laughs> um, and, he, and he saw me saying that he watches a lot of television. And he got, and I, I think I put a number to it on several, either, I said either several or four to five, I don't know, I think I said several hours of television a day. And he was enraged for like two days he was talking about this. And he kept going on and on about, you know, attacking me to various random Oval Office visitors and this got back to me. And so, you know, he's sensitive on that one because he thinks it speaks to the idea that people think he's not that intelligent. And, you know, that's an area of concern for him. Where would so. people get that idea? Um, so why, um, uh, Okay, so this is my this is the fundamental question that I have then the, about the difference between the thin thin skin and the thick skin. So when we get to the seriousness of the moment that we're in right now, um, people are laughing at him and do think he's stupid about the fact that he continues to advance a preposterous lie about the fact that he won the election. They do think that he's pathetic. They do think that he's a baby. Should I go on? Um, they do think a lot of <laughs> bad things about him. Like why doesn't that? Are you interviewing you or are you interviewing me? I'm why, just why doesn't? <laughs> it's a little <laughs> kind of shtick. <laughs> I'm just, just throwing a little shtick out there, Maggie. You're sick. That's okay, it. I'm trying to help carry us here. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> what? Okay, so when, so why doesn't? Why, how can a person not crack? How can he not show an inch of self? You know, uh, self-reflection on the fact that that he's carrying this ridiculous lie on two years hence. So I, I would frame it slightly differently. I don't think that his lies about the election are, are prompting people to call him stupid. Um, I, some are, you know, obviously calling him a baby over it. I think mostly people are calling him dangerous over right. it. Um, and, and I think that he, this kind of gets to your point about self-image, or your question about self-image. I, I don't think he minds people thinking, um, that he is, uh, you know, saying something that's dangerous because there's two portraits of him that he can tolerate. And one is total adoration and flattery. Yep. And the other is that he's a totally competent strong man. And, and, and this book is neither one of those, uh, as you know, because you've read it. Um, but he would rather people think that he is, you know, he is menacing and a little scary or more than a little scary. Um, than not, and, or than think that he's weak. And so that's how he doesn't crack. Okay, but I just... Sorry, that might be an unsatisfying answer. No, no, it is an unsatisfying answer, so I have to come back for one more follow-up on it. Is that, <laughs> like, it just, it takes a, a, a superpower that is just hard for me to wrap my brain around. We've seen him crack in other moments, right? Like, he's, he's like you just can see him on a stage where he has a shtick. You know, where, and you know he doesn't really, you know, you can kind of sense that he's not even really, doesn't really believe it. He's not cracking on this one, right? I mean, behind the scenes, do you, do you get that sense for anybody? Like where, like, where does that ability, that it's, it's, it's really, it's an inhuman, and I, I mean that as a particular word, like because humans like desire, you know, we, we, our brains require us to at least convince ourselves that it's true. It's the old George Costanza line, right? It's not a lie if you believe it, right? Like that's how we do it. Well, but that's, but that's your answer. You just answered answer. your question. I mean, it's, he, 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 I, listen, I, I get asked a lot, does he really believe this? And, and I'm not in his head. So I, yeah. you know, I don't know whether there's some nagging self-doubt um, questioning whether he lost, but I think he has convinced himself that, that what he's saying is true. And I, I write about this, that one of the, the things that he has, you know, he uses repetition. He has always used repetition. And he has said to various people in various settings in his life over the last 40 years, a version of if you say the same thing often enough, it becomes true and people believe it. Yeah. And I think he becomes one of the people, um, you know, who believe it. And I think that it is his ability to say things that are not true on matters big and small is unlike anyone I have ever covered. It is certainly un unlike anyone you have ever dealt with yeah. uh, in political life. And so I think that you can't underestimate the power that that has on one's own mental process and, and, and you know, 
when he is seeing that he is convincing more and more people, Tim, of this in the Republican Party, and that more and more candidates, and the Times just did a pretty jarring roundup of the number of election denying candidates who are running up and down the ballot, um, he considers that power. So that's how. The, the one, the closest I've seen him to cracking is almost in a weird, it went the other way, it's the, it's the Carrie Lake bit. You've seen this, where he kind of says about Carrie Lake that, uh, you know, this woman won't stop talking about the election fraud. Like, he's even impressed with his own ability yes. To, yes. to have, to have like, right. fooled some, like, to get somebody that is that impressive in his mind, right, to be able to, con to, to say this. Like, it, it almost is like in his own brain, he's like, wow, I really pulled this off a little bit. Well, if, you, if, if you think about the fact that he is somebody who has spent his life selling and selling people on his yeah. brand and his name and his you know, products, whatever those products were in any <laughs> given moment, and the idea that he, can, he treated his candidacy like it was a product he was selling, this, his lies about the 2020 election are now a product he is selling. And to your point, you know, the reaction is, wow, that person's really buying that product and they're, you know, they're moving on with it. Yeah. And so um, well, I don't think it's surprising. I think it's, I think it's a continuum of everything we've seen with him. Yeah, and one more parallel on the continuum. The, the net worth element of this, right? Mm -hmm. It is kind of parallel to that. And like you go, Eric, and is the Letterman yep. bit on this, and then you know, kind of you write about the other, you know, sort of the Forbes controversies and stuff. Like yep. talk about, you know, that, you know, how I mean, that was a lie he kept going for decades. So there was a couple. There are a couple of early, early lies that he tells about himself. One is um, this fiction that uh, he got from his father, which is that they would tell uh, people they were Swedish, not German because they had a lot of Jewish tenants in their properties. And this was in the post-World War II era and they didn't want to turn off tenants. And so Trump kept, kept this going for a really long time. Um, his, his, fa his father was the, the son of, of Germans um, who were born in Germany and, and, uh, and immigrated here. Um, number one, number two, um, you know, the net worth piece, he was obsessed with getting on the on the Forbes list, and the Forbes list was relatively new in the early 1980s. And Trump, you know, posed himself. Jonathan Greenberg, who was a uh, journalist who worked at Forbes at the time, has actually released tapes, I think, of of his conversations with Trump from that era, where Trump is is posing as as a you know a publicist or something, trying to get insist that that the Trump net worth is bigger than it is, and. Part of that, Tim, was not just Trump promoting himself, but minimizing his father. And wow. a big hidden hand in Trump's success was his father over a very long period of time. His father was key to his earliest deals. He couldn't, you know, he had no record of building when he was trying to acquire casino parcels. Um, he had, uh, you know, no, no real, you know, background ability to speak of when he tried doing uh, the Grand Hyatt project on 42nd Street in Manhattan, which was his, his first really big one. And his father had to be a, um, uh, a hidden backer. His father gave him money in ways that people did not see over a very long period of time. This was part of why the, the tax return story that my colleagues at the Times broke was so important mm -hmm. during the White House years. Um, that's all part of the myth too. I mean, Trump, the reality of Trump, and when you're asking about the behaviors, I would just point you to this too. He is a child of enormous privilege who believed and was raised to believe that life was going to be hardwired for him. Uh, and when you live that way for, you know, 70 years, you're very surprised when that comes to an end. Yeah. Um, you, the uh, other thing, the other element of the book that I liked is just kind of the way that you, um, you know, helped explain uh, and categorize like the ways, the moves that Trump has. Right. And mm -hmm. like this and you see just echoes of all the stuff, you know, from, you know, the moves that he had when he got backed into a corner in the 80s, you know, all the way through the, refo you know, the reform party, you know, all the way through now the present. So just just talk about that a little bit and like what what are the go to Trump moves and then and then from a journalist, how you try to parry with those. Sure. So, I, you know, I list I list a bunch of them in the in the book, but just off the top of my head, it's you know, it's the quick lie. Um, it's the, the shifting of blame, it's the backbiting with one aid, um, you know, about another. Um, it's the indecision and indecisiveness masked by a compensatory lunge. Uh, and we got to see all of these play out in the White House years, right? I mean, you know, the, the backbiting with AIDS was just constant and dominated everything. The indecisiveness we got to see over and over and over again. And I would argue he was actually, and I write about this, 
really indecisive about what route he wanted to take to try to subvert the election results in 2020, including like asking the valet who brings the Diet Coke um, what he thought he should do. Um, and, uh, you know, that was to me kind of a, a jarring moment. But then once all the other options are gone, he really, he does lunge at January 6th. Um, the quick lie we see over and over again, and I, you know, saw that in, in one of my interviews with him, I asked him, you know, that our understanding was he had been watching television on January 6th during the riot. And he immediately said he hadn't been, you know, no, I was in meetings. I rarely had the TV on. I mean, it was just like the immediate reaction. The audio of those interviews is really, um, I just went back and listened to it before we talked, is I mean, like his word salad and just his nonsense talk. Yeah, you know, it is kind of an enigma how you deal with him. And so I was curious, like, and then, you know, in the book, um, in a weird way, one of my favorite parts of the book was the pictures you have of the follow-up questions that you had that he never got to, where he like writes all bullshit yeah. answers on almost all, they're almost all bullshit, except for like one Except for a two. few what he admit, that he admits, which were quite notable, but yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, how did you, how do you as a reporter kind of, and as him as an interview subject, deal with such an inscrutable person? Like, how did you think about what am I going to ask him on, on tape? You know, I only have limited interviews. Like, just sort of talk about those exchanges. Yeah, yeah so it, it's a good question. The um, the first interview, they offered interviews to almost every single book author, um, and including Michael Wolff, who wrote like the most um, damning initial book portrait of that White House. And it was it was you know it was congruous with what we were all reporting in the daily newspapers, but it was it was not a positive portrayal. And like it just tells yeah. you about Trump's willingness to engage with reporters. And so initially, when they offered this, I was sort of like, I, you know, I don't really know what I'm going to get out of this, right? And so I, I wanted to ask a bunch of questions about his past because he's the only person who can answer those. I didn't want to listen to a bunch of filibustering about January 6th. And um, and actually, I, I got a fair amount out of it, which is throughout the book. And so then I asked for two follow-up interviews. Um, you know, there were, um, there were moments that I let him talk, like the one we just talked about with January 6th. Then there were moments where I, you know, challenged him in real time where he was he at one point was suggesting that it was Mark Milley's idea that for them to walk to St. John's Church um, across Lafayette Park uh, on yeah. 2020 during the, the, when he was holding the Bible up. Mark it just wanted not, to get a little exercise that day. He just, right, you know. Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, according to Trump, it was his idea. And I, I, I interrupted him and I said, because it was ridiculous. And so, and he said, well, let's just say it was equal. And okay. So, um, but, but so, you know, there are some of it you're just deciding moment to moment those later questions that you're referring to which are in the book were a bunch of additional fact checks that i got reporting on later um and that i needed to come back and give give him a chance to answer mm -hmm. um and in some cases you know he was the only person who could answer and so in one case he appeared to confirm for instance that he had sent money to the family of a convicted felon who had helped him on one of his earliest building projects, which has been a great mystery in New York City politics for a long time. So that was interesting. Um, he called almost every other question fake news, fantasy question. Um, fantasy question was one over and over and over again, you know, not true, et cetera, et cetera. The things he chose to confirm were that he had, um, he had gone with Marla Maples to a Michael Bolton concert after he <laughs> won her back from seeing Michael Bolton, who, who she was having a relationship with at the same time, or, you know, in, in contrast to Trump. And the other that he confirmed was, uh, said actually some truth to that, was that he used to refer to his uh, not yet wife, Melania Trump, as out of central casting. Hmm. Those were the things he chose to confirm. Yeah. Yeah, she is, isn't he? Or she is, isn't she? Or something like, or it's true. It was actually, actually some truth to that. Yeah, there's actually some truth to that. Um, <clears throat> one other thing from those interviews. Um, you, uh, uh, you asked him about the classified documents before it was a news story. And there was some like Order. scuttlebutt on Twitter. Some it was BS, right? Because it seemed to me that if you listen to the audio, it seems obvious that you just are kind of asking on a lark, right? And he right. like answers with total word salad. But what, 
What made you think that he might have taken classified documents? Like, sure. what, were you on a tip or just gut? No, I didn't. And I didn't ask about classified documents. And I, I appreciate how you just described the audio because I really hope people listen to it because it really it's about as clear as mud, to your point. Um, but no, it's that I asked because um, I just know him and know he's a hoarder and he was obsessed with, you know, trophies like the Kim Jong-un letters yeah. like he he would wave them around in front of reporters he would ask somebody to bring them in and he'd spread them out across the resolute desk and so I asked you know did you take anything with you and the okay. other the other thing that was going on at the time was that um my colleague Mike Schmidt was um doing a lot of reporting on um gifts that Trump or that during the Trump White House era that had gone missing like presidential gifts that had disappeared and they were trying to figure out what was happening. So anyway, so that was why I asked the question. And his response was, he said, nothing of great urgency, no. And yeah. so he appears to be denying it. And then he says something about the KJU letters. I, I couldn't even understand what he was saying, but it seemed like he was saying maybe he had them. And I was sort of surprised and said, oh, you were able to take those with you? And he said, uh, he said, he clearly registered my my surprise. And he said, no, uh, I think those are in the archives. You know, we have great things. It, it, it was meaningless but he it's like he started to say something and then caught himself and then took it back yeah i just uh it was interesting because it was like your it was the maggie spidey sense that's kind of what i wanted to ask about it right you didn't say specifically classified documents but it was no. just this sense it never would have occurred it would never right. would have occurred to me that you had taken classified right, documents. right exactly exactly i just wanted to correct <laughs> myself on that i wanted to more years. yeah more talk about the maggie spidey sense okay yeah. one other thing about the book and then we're going to a few rapid fire questions for me in the crowd um the rudy chapter i just I, I just, we couldn't get out of here without you talking about that. The Rudy Trump relationship, why he sort of lets him he sort of run roughshod around the White House in a way that other people did. And do you think that's also related to the New York backstory and, and reverence for him? Or just sort of talk about that relationship because Rudy ended up causing a lot of trouble for Trump that he didn't need and yet still is around, I guess, right? Is he still around? I guess you would know. Ish. I mean, ish. I, you know, it's, it's Trump is nice to him, but Trump rolls his eyes at him a lot. Look, um, they were not friends in New York, okay? I mean, they, they really, um, Trump, Trump was a donor. Trump was someone who Giuliani wanted to keep on his side. Giuliani was seen as very helpful with one Trump project in particular on the east side near the UN when he was mayor. Um, when uh, Giuliani was running for president, um, I don't think Trump was even really around. I think Don Jr. did something for him uh, as a fundraising, uh, uh, you know, event, but or, or donation, but that was it. Um, and then when Trump was um, running himself, I think Giuliani, you know, sort of saw the attention he was getting when Trump did this tweet, this retweet of somebody who was insulting Heidi Cruz, Ted Cruz's wife. Mm -hmm by putting a picture of her next to Melania Trump and saying a picture's worth a thousand words. And it was a very unflattering picture of Heidi Cruz. Um, Giuliani started telling people, I can't endorse him after that. This was around April, 2016. So that lasted about you know four months until the Access Hollywood tape. And then suddenly Giuliani saw the opportunity to advance himself and he you know, became, became this constant fighter for Trump. And that Trump doesn't value anything more than he values a fighter. So that's how, and Giuliani badly wanted to be Secretary of State. Um, Jared Kushner, among other people, blocked it. I think the people who blocked it still feel pretty good about having blocked it uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and Giuliani did not want another job. And so Giuliani then proceeded to pop up at various points. And when Trump was in real potential jeopardy, when Michael Cohen, another lawyer for him, was searched by the FBI and was clearly under investigation. Giuliani was the one who counseled, let's take a tougher approach and Trump valued that. And so that's how Giuliani stays around. But, you know, he's willing to endure Trump's petty humiliations, you know, just like a number of other people. Why? Because uh, it gives him power. Trump, I, this isn't in the book, but Giuliani kept saying to people um, after, um, January 6th, when it was clear that there was gonna be another impeachment trial, most likely, he kept saying to people, I need to be his lawyer. And I think that sums it up. 
Um, I wanted to move on to, to, to two Tim conspiracy theories, but one thing you brought up uh, uh, adds to something else in the book uh, that should be mentioned. The because uh, you, you, it's an interesting nugget and just left me wanting a little more. And in a 2,700 page book, like that's pretty, that's pretty important. <laughs> and that is- um, I hope you all notice that it gained 900 pages. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bit. Um, uh, Kushner, uh, Trump wanted to fire Kushner. It wasn't just yeah. Rudy they wanted to get rid of. He, Trump wanted to fire the Kushner and, and Ivanka. Now, he never fired anybody. This is another one of your correct observations in the book. That was all just a, a farce from the show. But, but he wanted Kelly to do it. What, like, what, came, like, what was that all about? Like, what came of that? Right? Why, you know, was that something that came and, go, came and went? Or what was, what was your sense of that story? It came and went a lot during 2017 because Jared Kushner was getting some really negative headlines in relation to the Mueller investigation, uh, as well as the fact that he and his wife had used a uh, private email server, which Trump was very upset about because, uh, you know, as, as people might recall, <laughs> Trump made a thing of that in 2016 with his opponent. Uh, and so they were just, you know, it was it looked like Jared was it was a focus of Mueller, um, you know, at least uh, under intense scrutiny. And there was a, dis a feeling that it would be better if they left. And Trump just never wanted to do it himself. And so he he tried to get Kelly and Don McGahn, the White House counsel, to do it. And they protested. And, you know, you're not going to back us if we do this. And, you know, your, your daughter comes to you and complains. Uh, and then so there was finally this tweet that Trump was ready to send saying they were leaving. Um, and, it, you know, it would not have been, it would have been in, in the nice grouping of Trump people are leaving tweets, right? Except just would have been his family. Um, and Kelly stopped him because he hadn't discussed it with them. And, you know, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly strangely felt that's not how you treat your, your family. Um, and then Trump just didn't go ahead and deal with it. Um, all right. Uh, the t two Tim conspiracy questions. I want to do a quick rapid fire from the audience here. Um, and then we'll let you get your NyQuil. Um, <laughs> uh, my conspiracies. One is he tried to kill Joe Biden with COVID in that first debate intentionally, right? He knew he had COVID. He saw Joe Biden was old. And he was like, I'm going to go with COVID and I want him to get it. I want to give him COVID. I, I, can't, I can't go with you there. <laughs> no, you don't think that that's right? You do think he knew he had COVID before the debate. I do. I, I think it's hard to imagine that he didn't know he had COVID, COVID yeah. before the debate. But you don't think that he thought it was I like don't a think that biological was, weapon? I don't think it was we're all going down to the Okay. I think um, he just didn't think that he was sick. The, so. the missing, um, this is where resistance Tim comes in, all right? So just bear with me. The missing minutes of the, you, you write about the Helsinki kind of back and forth, but there, there still is. I mean, he has pri this a lot of 20 minutes or whatever, pri private time with Putin and just yeah, translators. Like, what is, yeah, yeah, more than that. So w what yeah. is your sense for what was happening there? What did his advisors think was happening? Do we have any, any vi it's, it's odd that he has a seat. He's not good at secrets, right? Uh, no, he actually can be very good at secrets when they're his own. He's obsessed with other people's secrets and he, he will share other people's secrets. It's his own that he's actually pretty good at keeping. Um, so he's very good at compartmentalizing. I, it could be anything under the sun, Tim, but among the things that his own staff speculated heavily about, um, you know, that meeting was, was one of them. Um, uh, the secret thing, last thing in my notes here, I did have this. Um, given that he is, okay, so he's good at keeping his own secrets. He's not good at keeping other people's secrets. I think one thing that, that gives me a little peace about the Trump administration is that all of like the worst secrets about America, the aliens, JFK killing, like we know all those conspiracies are not true at this point, right? Like he, if he had a good one, if he had a good one that he was briefed on, like he would have shared it by now. I think. So it's funny that you asked that. Um, <laughs> this isn't in the book, but I did ask, no, I asked him about UFOs and JFK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because he, he declassified a bunch of the JFK files, yeah. as you may recall. And then there was some issue where they weren't released. Um, but he told me that he, I wish I had the answer in front of me, but he said, I said, did you, did you look at those files and did you learn anything that changed how you look at the government? And he said he never really looked at them because he wasn't particularly interested in either one of them. And I don't think that's true about Kennedy. So, um, you know, I believe he looked at that and I believe that, um, I believe that he's painfully aware of, of circumstances surrounding, you know, an assassinated president. So, um, but he didn't, but he didn't give it up. So the truth is still out there. Okay, some rapid fire from the crowd. Um, <clears throat> is there anything likable about Donald Trump? 
I mean, I feel like that's an, an in the eye of the beholder question. <laughs> um, he can he can be very charming. Uh, he actually can be funny. He he, uh, despite this, there's this belief that he doesn't laugh. He does laugh. Um, you know, but but this that's not the that's not the prevailing side. One thing that people answer that question with the likability question about is the family thing, and I I thought it was a noticeable. Um, absence from the book was Donald Trump the father mm -hmm. um, at least when the kids were younger there's a lot of talk about mm -hmm. the you know during the White House years Th that is because that, that it was absent from the book because it was absent from his life at that time it was or? absent from the book because it would be uh, because it was complicated in his life and because it was really impossible to do a full portrait without spending much more time on it than I wanted to frankly um, you know, I mean he was I, I think that people can draw their own conclusions when a father is, you know, battling with the mother on the front pages of the papers, yeah. um, you know, for a month. So. Uh, back to the, the audience questions uh, on this topic. Do Trump's kids know that he's lying? Uh, sometimes. What about no. about the what about the election? Oh, about the election? I mean, look, I, I suspect that some of them genuinely believe that he was cheated because I think that's how they all view the world. Yeah. Um, or many of them view the world. Um, you know, this has come up a lot about Ivanka Trump in particular since the January 6th hearings. But, um, you know, I think that she tried to put some distance between herself and what he was saying. But if she didn't believe it, um, she didn't do a whole lot to stop it. So, yeah, um, three, three more uh, rapid questions from online and then we'll let you go. Um, which legal actions do you think worry him most? Uh, the documents investigation. Why? because it's the one that is the most easy to distill and directly relates to him. Yeah. On January 6th, he can actually hide behind other people. Um, has Trump, in your experience in all those interviews, ever acknowledged any error or bad decision? Um, yes, actually, and it's in the book. He, it's pretty interesting, and that's a good question, and this is not gonna be a rapid answer, so if you were looking that's for okay. that, I apologize. But um, I, he talked about, he complained at length about endorsing, he, but basically he had gotten tricked into endorsing Ben Sass, the Nebraska senator, hmm. for his reelect, um, who, you know, is about to become uh, uh, a, a chancellor in Florida. Um, but he, he was talking about how, you know, uh, I think it was Lindsey Graham and Ted Cruz had gotten him to do this, and he said something like, like a schmuck, I went along with it. And it's rare to hear him say something like that. But it was interesting both because it was acknowledging an error, number one, and number two, it goes to sort of his broader mindset about his presidency, which is that like he was tricked over and over again, that he was tricked into making, you know, X, Y, Z decision. He was tricked into hiring X, Y, Z people and that he's going to do it differently next time because he gets that now. I think it's the scariest part about the next administration, in my opinion, right, is, is less him per se than, than he hit, did. That is, I think that's his big lesson, right, from the first administration, that too many people personnel. he didn't trust, too many personnel, yeah. never Trump person. Yeah, person. I mean, per, everything with Donald Trump comes down to personnel. That's what he understands best. Um, who are the other Trump reporters you like the most? Jonathan Swan and Josh Dossie are, and, and Mike Bender are... Um, amazing reporters they're all killing up i agree okay the last one um is i think the most important question so i saved it for last i'm so happy someone in the audience wrote this because i would have asked it exactly like this if not as a mother of three a wife and an amazingly accomplished journalist also an amazing mother how how's work-life balance going for you <laughs> well it's 10 p.m my time and i'm here with you <laughs> so, um I, it's not been my um of, of accomplishments in my life, work-life balance has not been one of them. But, um, you know, one of these days. Well, I monitor your Instagram, and those kids love you. I don't know. I don't, I don't understand it. I'm getting texts from you. You're posting on Instagram. You're on CNN at the same time. Sometimes I do wonder <laughs> if there are multiple Maggies. You're writing a 600-page book. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I Thanks bow to you. Out. Thank you. Um, we could, have, uh, uh, we could have done two hours. Maggie, thanks for joining us today. Um, I want to thank our audience here in San Francisco and online around the country. Today's program will be available as a video and podcast on the club's website, www.commonwealthclub.org, to learn more. You can purchase copies of Maggie's book outside. You can purchase mine on Amazon.com uh, or wherever books are sold. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. We'll see you all soon. 
Thank you. Good night. Bye, Tim.